afternoon and welcome to this, today's presentation, Danger, Do Not Microwave This Product. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law since the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Mr. Schiffman will discuss microwave ovens, what you need to know about microwave ovens, microwave hazards, location sensitivity, third degree burns, and lessons. To give you a little background about our presenter, Mr. Bob Schiffman has been actively working in all areas of microwave heating, including microwave ovens, food, packaging, cookware, and medical devices, as well as industrial microwave processing. An independent consultant since 1971 for over 200 clients, he has also served as an expert witness in 39 cases related to microwave heating. For over 40 years, he's been teaching international courses in microwave science and technology and has chaired over 20 international conferences on these and allied topics. He is currently serving his 17th year as the president of the International Microwave Power Institute. He has 28 U.S. patents and over 50 scientific publications. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is microwave. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The, the Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will be sending out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list by clicking the link at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today. And Bob, the presentation is now turned over to you. OK, can you hear me OK? Hello? Can yes, you hear loud me? and clear. OK, great. Yes, I can right, hear hi you. Hi, everyone. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, happy to, to know that you're all here. As Rochelle just told you, I've been uh, involved with microwave heating since 1961 and uh, <clears throat> seen a lot, done a lot. And one of the things that has really intrigued me over this uh, period of time are products that actually um, injure people. So as you can see in, in this slide, I've served as an expert now in 39 cases and about to do my 40th. Uh, and approximately half of these involved injuries to people from microwavable products. And of those, about half are non-food products. And that's where I want to concentrate because I've never met a non-food product that I think should be microwaved. And I'll explain why and hope you'll, you'll understand that. And I can tell you that some of these injuries have been so severe they've resulted in, in uh, surgery and hospitalization and so forth. Um, so here, what we're going to do, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what microwaves, uh, why microwaves should never be used to heat non-food products. Uh, these products can cause serious third-degree burns. Uh, they've caused fires and even deaths. I'm not going to talk about that. I wasn't involved in that. But I will tell you the, the background of it because it does relate to one of the cases that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to present you with two case studies. Actually, it's three because the second one I'm breaking up into two parts all related to the same basic product. Um, and these two cases, uh, case studies, relate to injuries that came about from um, microwavable, non-food microwavable products. <clears throat> and um, the two products are quite different in, in structure. And yet, uh, and, and the causes, uh, therefore, are somewhat different. But at the same time, both are dangerous. Uh, and finally, um, there's another issue that I'd like to touch on toward the end. And that is, shouldn't manufacturers know that their products are dangerous? One of the things that shocks me in uh, my expert witness work is that 
uh, in one case, one of the manufacturers of a, one of these products has been sued a number of times, but is always, always settled, and they keep on putting the same product out on the shelves, even though uh, it's been shown to be dangerous. And uh, that's kind of shocking, but I think, uh, you know, it's sort of an issue, I think, of, of uh, maybe of greed. But we won't go into that. I'll just talk about the, um, you know, what a manufacturer should really do. Because the reason they often don't know or don't realize how dangerous their products are because they don't know how to test them. They test them very inadequately, and I'll talk about that towards the end. Okay, so just brief background. Microwave ovens uh, are certainly a big uh, major appliance in our, in our homes. The real sales started around the 1970s. Right now, they're in about 95% of American homes. It means they're about oh, maybe 150 million microwave ovens in the United States. Many homes have more than one. It's not uncommon to send a kid off to college uh, with a microwave oven uh, for, for his uh, dorm room. Um, <clears throat> on a worldwide basis, there are over a billion microwave ovens. Uh, almost all of them made in China today, some in Malaysia and so on. But they all were big markets started in the 70s in the United States. We lost that market to Japan, which lost it to Korea, and now it's all in, in China. Okay, so what do you have to know about microwaves? I'm, I'm really not going to teach you a great deal because uh, that's, a, that's a subject of, that goes on a couple of hours at least. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that's important for you to understand because they'll relate to why injuries occur. So first... First, and this is the single most important thing you'll ever, ever learn about microwave energy. Microwaves are form, not a form of heat. Microwaves are a form of energy. And um, now think about it. A common form of energy that everybody knows is the light bulb. The light bulb in your, in your office, in your home, the light bulb puts out... Uh, Light waves, they're called electromagnetic waves in a particular part of what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. And <clears throat> those waves travel through the air. They don't light up the air. What they do is light up what they come in contact with, for example, the walls in a room, your table, your desk, your hands. And they do it in such a way that the light is reflected into your eyes and your eyes then transmit that information to the brain, which then creates the thing that we see. Well, light waves basically is a way of transmitting energy, light energy, through space. Microwaves are basically the same. They're a form of energy that's generated in a kind of a bulb. In this case, it's called a magnetron, rather sophisticated bulb. And they are uh, sent through space and to do things. And until they interact with the material, reach a material, nothing really happens to them. The air is transparent. Air doesn't get hot. So <clears throat> let's take your microwave oven. The microwave energy is what we call launched. That is, it, sh it shines into this little metal box that you have. It has a, a five-sided steel box with a door on it. And inside that box is where you put your food or whatever you want to heat. And the microwave energy just simply travels through the air, bounces off those walls, and penetrates what you want to heat, say your cup of coffee, and it gets it hot. But until it reaches the, the food, nothing happens. It, it doesn't heat the air, as I've said. So it, all it can do is it, some, when it reaches the uh, coffee or whatever, it then interacts with the molecules in there, and I won't go into that. It's kind of sophisticated. But let's just say that it, the energy from that wave then gets transmitted to the, the energy, to the molecules in the coffee, and it does something to them to create heat. Okay? So until it reaches the material, there is no, no heat. Okay. Now, one thing I do want to just as a side issue there's a hell of a lot more energy in, in your ordinary light bulb than there is in a microwave oven. So when you hear people worrying about cancer or damaging nutrients in foods, that's nonsense. Because there's not enough energy. 
a light has about, oh, say, 30 to 50 million times more energy than microwave energy. Okay, so at the same time, because it is energy that's going into the food or any other material, uh, temperature is something very different. We don't talk about the temperature of microwaves. We talk about the temperature that the food heat uh, reaches or the whatever material. And it turns out that if you just keep on exposing materials to microwave energy, you can literally reach thousands of degrees. We've, we've melted a Pyrex uh, beaker in our lab. And that melts at about, well, 2,500 to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you can really get up to high temperatures. Uh, but on the other hand, one of the beauties of water is that you can only get to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, uh, until it boils off. And that's a major factor why foods are generally much safer than these non-food materials. Okay. Um, let's see. Here we go. Let's talk about these hazards. Um, there are consumers who are still worried about microwave oven leakage, uh, the dangers of using metals in microwave ovens, and the nutritional effects on foods, and residual microwaves in the foods. Well, most of these things, I mean, they're really pretty nonsensical. There really is very little to worry about. The interaction with with effect on metals, yeah, they can spark an arc, but I did the original research on this back in 1978, still quoted around the world, and a very, uh, yeah, it's, it's a sign of very important conditions under which it can cause something. And that arc can't do anything unless it reaches something that's flammable like paper. And uh, uh, anyway, we'll talk about that because one of the things I do want to talk about is fires. Okay, so let's go on now and talking about these oven hazards. There are some hazards with foods, and we have to really pay attention to those. Uh, overheating of foods is very common, and the hidden high temperatures. Uh, I point out particularly baby food and baby uh, formulas because um, those can get very, very hot on the inside while the surface seems very cool, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, <clears throat> And there was a study reported in the New York Times a few years ago of 3,000 infants having their throats scalded by either the overheated baby food or formula. Um, another thing is steam generation. I don't know how many of you make microwave popcorn, but that popcorn bag is formulated and made in such a way that when the popcorn expands, <clears throat> blows up and you really pops, the bag is supposed to open to release the steam. Well, it's possible that it doesn't, in which case, if a consumer then pulls open that bag, it's possible for them to get a, a puff of steam in the face. And uh, there have been some reports in medical literature of, of uh, eye damage because of that steam. Um, boil over, those of you who have probably experienced that, uh, you heat a cup of water in the microwave oven, add some instant coffee, and all of a sudden the thing seems to erupt. And there's a sophisticated reason that happens. In fact, I'm the pers first person to ever uh, write about why that is. Okay. And then finally, this is an interesting one for me, and that's why I call volcano ex uh, effects. Uh, microwave energy tends to heat things a little more towards the bottom than towards the top in most foods. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, the result is that uh, it's possible in some products to uh, get more heating on the bottom and the product gets hot and maybe it forms a steam bubble and that bubble's got to get out and what happens, it erupts and it puts everything into the air. Okay, but now I want to talk about heating non-food products. And I'm going to do this in the form of talking about uh, two uh, product liability cases the second one, well, I'm going to have an offshoot of that one because the same basic product uh, was involved in a medical malpractice suit, which had rather uh, disastrous effects upon the uh, uh, person who was injured. So let's talk first about case number one. In this case, 
a consumer heated a one ounce container of what's called a microwave wax depilatory uh, for a little over a minute. Now, for those of you who don't know what a wax depilatory is, wax depilatories are actually waxes that get heated and melted. Women use these primarily. Some men, I guess, might use them, but women use them. <clears throat> they spread them on the skin to, use, to remove, let's say, bikini hair or facial hair. <clears throat> the, the wax hardens, and then they pull it off. Um, I can't imagine any man in his right mind doing this because the pain must be incredible, but it just shows women have a much higher tolerance for pain than men. In any event, um, the way it's generally done is that <clears throat> the wax is uh, supposed to be, a little wax container that contains the wax is supposed to be immersed in hot water, boiling water, until it melts the wax. And then you take it out and you put it on your skin, and it should be around, oh, 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit at that point. But there are, and, and I should tell you this, that many years ago, um, I'm going to say more than 20 years ago, Nairtrake came out with a microwave old product and got so many potential lawsuits, I looked at it, it called me in immediately, and I tested it, and I said, get it off the market, it's dangerous. Okay, so here's this case. The wax, it was in a little one-ounce container, was heated for one minute, and it became so hot that it actually melted through the container. The container's made of polypropylene, which melts around 365 degrees Fahrenheit. And as she pulled it out of the microwave oven, you'll see a picture of what happens to the container. And it, the wax, hot melted wax, which was about 400 degrees at that point, poured all over her hand and wrist and arm with really serious results. Uh, the wax then, its, it's property is the heat is just hardened very quickly, and now she couldn't get it off besides all the pain. And she had to be, uh, be taken by 911 into a hospital where the wax was removed surgically. She had to have skin grafts and all kinds of other things as a result. Okay, so here's a picture of that kind of container. You can see what's happened. This happened in my lab um, almost uh, in the first day I tested this product. Uh, and you can see what's happened. It melts, as I said earlier, it tends to heat more towards the bottom. And so it melted right down at the bottom of the container and poured out all over the, uh, the turntable in that microwave oven. By the way, it w I did this in a number of ovens, but let me tell you about this one particularly. My role in this case when I was hired was to determine how the accident could have occurred, um, to offer an opinion on the safety of the product being heated in a microwave oven, and determine if there's a safe non-microwave method of preparing the product. After all, if if there is none, then, you know, the product is uh, should never, well, I don't believe it should be microwave in the first place, but... Uh, you know, you'd see if there's a good alternative, and there certainly is in this case, and I'll talk about that. I tested it. works wonderfully. Okay, so uh, as I said earlier, wax depilatories are waxes that are used to remove body hair, facial hair, and so forth. Um, the wax is melted, as I said, and it applied to the skin. When it hardens, it's pulled off. Now, this is this is an important part of this. The basic formulas, there are quite a few different variations on a formula, but two critical ingredients are carnauba wax and rosin. The rosin is there to make it sticky. So in a sense, it you know, it'll stick well to your skin, but of course, if it's overheated, that becomes a problem because you'll really get burned. And of course, there are minor ingredients, there are uh, fragrances and that kind of thing. So you have to ask yourself, well, why, why are these products like that? Why are they dangerous when you microwave them? Well, a fundamental uh, issue here is these are products that don't contain water. Remember, water boils at 212 degrees, and the temperature can't get hotter than 212 degrees as long as there's water there. However, waxes boil at about 700 degrees. In other words, you can keep on heating uh, wax up to its boiling point and even beyond that. 
But um, so you can see now that that's a that's a very very big difference, and of course, it it becomes a dangerous situation because there's no water there's no water in this product. There's some other sophisticated things that have to do with water. Water has a very peculiar problem in microwave uh, energy, and that is that the hotter it gets, the slower it heats. So it's like as you're, you know, in your driving in your car and you come towards a red light, you put your foot on the brake and you slow the car down. Well, it's a sort of the same thing. As water gets hotter, it sort of puts the brake on the heating rate. Uh, but that doesn't happen with wax. Uh, on the contrary, it takes much less energy to heat the wax uh, the same amount as it does uh, water. Okay, so let's go on from here and talk about a little bit more. So as I said, this is the reason they can become dangerously hot. Uh, just give me one second. I'm I'm very bad at following my own notes. So, Okay, here we are. So now I'm going to talk to you about something else, the lesson number two on what you have to know about microwave ovens, because that applies to this particular situation, this particular accident. It can apply over this over the uh, range of that, not just not just these wax depilatories. It can apply to lots of other products as well. But I'll focus just on here and this. One of the things you may have heard about microwave ovens is that the energy the distribution in the oven is kind of non-uniform. That is, there are places we call hot spots and cold spots. What that means is that this, if you just look in the oven and you, you take a, some location in the oven, there may be more energy or less energy than a, than a, a position, let's say, an inch away. Uh, I had the interesting uh, situation some years ago go of putting two marshmallows in a microwave oven and <clears throat> turning on the microwave energy and one of them expanded like crazy and the other one just sat there and never got hot. And they were only about an inch apart. Okay, so um, you'll find that those places, the hot, what I call hot spots, that's where things really get hot. And the um, cold spots where they don't get very much heat at all. There will be some, but not that much energy. Uh, the other thing I told you is that the bottom, right along, let's say if you've got a turntable in the oven or if no turntable on the floor of the oven, the product gets hottest down in those areas. Okay. Now, here's what I discovered. I took the plaintiff's microwave oven, which is GE oven, standard GE over-the-range oven. And I found an interesting thing. If I took that same container that we looked at, that one-ounce container, and I placed it out near the outer edge of the turntable, which is generally where you should put things because that way it fully rotates. By the way, it rotates so it passes food, let's say, through hot and cold spots to sort of even everything out. Well, anyway, I put it out near the outer edge, and it got to 140 degrees Fahrenheit in one minute. But when I put it in the center, it got to 410 degrees in one minute. Now, in other words, there was a serious hot spot in the center and not at the edge. So, the, so now, um, as I told you, that polypropylene container melts at around 365. So, of course, the wax was hot enough to melt right through it, as you saw. I then tested a lot of ovens. I own about 50 microwave ovens. And um, uh, I have them in two in two different labs, but uh, I took about ten or so in this lab and checked the distribution of microwave energy. And it uh, it could be in different locations. I'm about to show you there are hot spots and cold spots, but they can be at different locations. So it's not that this particular oven was anything wrong with it. There was nothing wrong with it. It's just the profile of this oven. Um, and, uh, well, I'll get into that. I See, I put this in here. that I found that the product can be heated safely in boiling water. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Anyway, I wanted to show you this. Here's a picture of distribution of microwave uh, energy. These are called thermograms. Uh, they're done with an infrared camera. And you'll see 
to the right of each one of these pictures, you'll see a sliding scale going uh, vertically. And the darker colors means the temperature is cooler, and the, high, the lighter to white means that's hotter. So the one on the left, you can see the serious hot spot in the middle. Um, and kind of a dead zone surrounding it, and then more energy around the edge of the turntable, but definitely more energy in the center. Another oven has exactly the opposite situation. Very little energy in the center, and almost everything is around the edge. The one all the way on the right has no turntable in it, and so that gives you a good picture of the distribution. I should tell you also that these hot spots and cold spots are in three dimensions. In other words, we're looking at it in a horizontal, horizontally, let's say, on the, along the turntable. If you go up, say, um, oh, about uh, two, two and a half inches or so, you'll find that uh, where, where a hot spot was maybe uh, on the turntable, uh, you'll see if you start going up, you'll see it gets, becomes more, more of a cold spot and all of a sudden repeats itself after maybe two, two and a half, three inches. Okay, and by the way, that was that work was done by a good colleague of mine, uh, Greg Hooper, in uh, Camden Research in England. Okay, so here's the conclusion of that case. Number one, I demonstrated that the product is dangerous. Number two, I found a safe non-microwave way to heat the product. That is, put it in boiling water for about five to seven minutes. It comes out perfectly fine, about 100 and, uh, 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, perfectly safe. Uh, and the case was settled in the plaintiff's favor. I'm going to uh, break right here and ask if there are any questions. Yes. The first question, if all the attendees can enter the passcode for today, the passcode is microwave. And we have a question. Do microwaves lose energy over the years? I have a microwave I've had since 1999 and I believe it does not heat up as well as it, as it did in the past. I tend to have to put my dinner plate on about two to three minutes in order for it to be at a normal high temperature, whereas in 1999, the one minute plus button did the trick. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's true. You, you're identifying something that's very true. Uh, microwave, uh, the tube that creates the microwave energy is called a magnetron, and it does age. Uh, and so it takes longer, and it, it's like <clears throat> before it puts out its energy, it has to warm up. I don't. Rem you, some of you may remember that, we, uh, that there are uh, televisions that come on instantly. Otherwise, it takes a, a you know a few seconds for the television picture to appear. Um, and uh, the same thing in a microwave oven. Uh, the, the the tube has something called a filament. It's got to get hot before it generates the microwave. Just filament is similar to the kind of filament you have in a light bulb. And uh, it takes some time, usually two, two seconds or so, to heat up and then generate the microwave energy. Um, and, but as the tube uh, ages, uh, that filament takes longer and longer. So you're absolutely right. It will take longer and longer. Not, there's nothing wrong with your microwave oven. You're still happy with the, the end product. It may take you longer, but... Uh, and I can also tell you from personally, I'm going to tell you that older ovens like that are much better than what's made today out of China. Not to, not to say with China, it's just generally true. Any other questions? Are all wax depilatories dangerous? What if they are in a larger jar? Yes, good. Also, yes. The, the critical thing is that they're waxes. Now, they, they can be other things, too. They can be things called emulsions, too. But the, the problem really is one that the temperature can get so high. And um, there's some other things about it. I won't bother you with some other physics that uh, have to do with it. But say you went from a one-ounce jar to a, a three-ounce jar, a larger jar, um, you still have the same problem. The energy would probably, distribution would be somewhat different uh, in that jar, but it still can get, uh, overheated. You know, that, that there's another issue that's in here that I'm going to talk about in the next section, which has the fact that the critical crazy thing in a microwave oven is that the air is cold. So 
you know, when you look at the surface, they tell you, check the surface if it's melted or not. Well, we did some work like that. We found, hey, the surface was not melted on this wax, but underneath it was, you know, was already dangerously hot, 150, 160 degrees or higher. So, um, yeah, so just changing the size won't, won't help. Next question. Do hot spots or cold spots, for that matter, tend to usually be in the same spot in a given microwave oven? Yes, but. <laughs> yes, but. The answer is yes and no. If the oven is pretty much empty, uh, yeah, then it's pretty standard. They will be. Uh, they they will have pretty much the same uh, condition. But you see, what's peculiar about a microwave oven is uh, that what you put in a microwave oven affects what's coming out of that tube. And so it's possible that you put something in a microwave oven and these hot and cold spots shift some. Um, but in the case of this, um, it, it, the, the, the great ones that I showed you in, that thermo, in those thermograms, those are largely due to um, pretty much fixed situation. Um, it's lesser in these turntable ovens, less of a concern because you're rotating around through them. And they generally tend to stay in the same location. It's in the where there's no turntable that you can have a lot of movement around. They'll be different. Next question. Questions? Is there any legislation regarding microwave performance for food safety regarding hot spots and cold spots? No, not at all. Um, not, not in the least, and uh, um, and it would be very difficult to do that because um, if I say I, I go to a um, uh, go to a manufacturer, let's say in China, and he's making the ovens for uh, say Panasonic, all the same ovens, and I take 50 off the line, consecutive off the line, and I do a very careful measurement, and that the kind of thing I know how to do, do a very careful measurement of hot spot and cold spots they'll be different from oven to oven. They won't be the same at all. So it's uh, it's a very complex situation. It has to do with the electronics of the oven. Next question. My wife uses a microwavable beanbag device that works like a heating pad. She likes the product because there is no apparent danger when using it at night if she falls asleep with it, which you never want to happen with a heating pad. Are these things okay? No. Uh, I'm glad you ra raised that question. The next section is going to have to do with uh, heating pads and uh, the gels. Uh, the kind of heating pad you're talking about are less um, popular in the United States. They're very popular in England. There was a case a few years ago of a woman who had a – they use wheat, not uh, – I don't know what you have – the, the uh, is in your wife's uh, uh, bean bag, but um, they use wheat. Other things that are used are rice and things like that, but they tend to get very hot in the center. And in this case, a woman did very much what you described your wife to do. She heated this thing, put it in bed like a hot water bottle, and got into bed, and it caught fire. The fire because it got so hot on the inside that it actually uh, caught fire. It was actually burning on the inside. She didn't know that, and it actually killed her. So you have to be very, very careful with those. So there's, your wife certainly can you keep using it, but when she microwaves it, heat it up, tell her to, um, with her fingers, sort of manipulate it around and not, to, you know, so that it just feels, feels warm and leave it for about, oh, a minute before she uses it. And she should be okay after that. Uh, our last question. Are you saying that even if a consumer follows directions exactly, it's still possible for the wax to be overheated and causing injury? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, the reason is that these ovens, all ovens differ, and it may be fine in a thousand different uh, consumers' ovens, and a thousand and one, lo and behold, it happens. And all of them can be using a, approximately the same time. One of the things that is it, you'll see on these directions is to test the product before it should it should be have a creamy uh, consistency. It should 
and the surface should be melted. And they give you a little plastic stick and you poke it with that. Well, what I said earlier is that very often that sur- top surface of wax is not melted. And so you poke it and you think, well, it's still pretty hard. It's not melted. Lo and behold, it, it is underneath. So that's a, a critical thing. One other comment and then we'll go on. But the other comment is remember this, that approximately 23% of the American population is functionally illiterate. What that means is they can't read a newspaper and understand it. So it's also possible that they can't, probable that they can't understand the directions on uh, one of these wax depilatories. So there's a loaded gun right there. Okay. Uh, Okay, thanks, Bob. You continue on with the presentation. Great. Okay. All right. Well, folks, Let's go on now. I want to go talk about case number two, which is sort of in line with the, one of the questions that are there. <clears throat> and this uh, involved a microwavable heating pad. And on this case, however, rather than being filled with rice or wheat or, so, or other little uh, solid grains like that, it was filled with a gel. Gels are um, water-based things. Like the, most of you know what Jello is, and Jello, if you if you look at, I'll take it, forget about the sugar in it. It's got what's called a gelling agent, and it's some kind of a gum. Like, uh, and what you do is you add water to it, and because it it forms kind of a lattice work, and it captures the water molecules inside of it, and so it gets to be this semi-solid that we know of. It so it's no longer a liquid, and it becomes this. This gel that we we'll use G E L, whereas Jello is J E L L O. Okay, but they're the same thing. They're gels. Okay, so they're based on um, water. And what the products for these reuse? What they're supposed to? I want you to note the word reusable. Reusable gel microwave heating pads. The consumer microwaves the product and places on a sore muscle. Well. In this case, and I've done, I think, uh, at least three cases like this, maybe a fourth one I, escapes me right now, but at least three. The consumer did that, and it resulted in a third-degree burn. And the reason for it, and it goes back to the question about the, the uh, uh, heating pad that uh, someone asked before, is what I call hidden high temperatures. And let me ex- – whoop. I may have gone too far. Let me see. Okay. So, um, the um, my role in this case was to uh, determine how the accident might have occurred, and to determine the safety of the product when microwave. These are uh, things that the attorneys asked me to focus upon. So now we have to come to number three. What is the important lesson you folks have to know? First of all, what I said earlier, the crazy thing about a microwave oven is the air in the microwave oven is cold. The air does not get hot. I mean, I've done some rather sophisticated uh, tests in uh, a patent infringement suit and showed that even if you heat something very large in in, in a microwave oven, the air the temperature goes up maybe a de- degree or two. does not go up very much at all. Uh, part of the reason for that, of course, I said, is the air doesn't absorb any microwave energy. The other thing is that there's a fan. Uh, you may hear it sometimes. There's a fan over on the right side of the microwave oven where the, the tube is, the magnetron. It keeps the magnetron cool. It's then blown across the oven and exits the left side. And in doing that, it it keeps the moisture level down. Otherwise, it could rain inside the oven. So the oven, so therefore, since the air is cool, the surface of anything is never the hottest place. The hottest place is always some place on the inside. So in other words, what I've just said is that the inside can become very, very hot, but the outside may simply just feel, feel cool. But there is something called the second law of thermodynamics, and part of the major part of that is that heat travels from hot to cold. In other words, um, if you uh, if if you have something that's very hot, 
and you put it down on something that's cold, it will cause that cold thing to heat up. And that's exactly what happens. In this case, the center of, uh, let's say, one of these heating pads can get very, very hot. The surface will feel cool, but the heat will and the heat will travel from that hot place on this inside and go to the outside. And I'm going to show you the devastating effect of that in a minute. So, as I said, the surface initially feels cool, but a few seconds later, it starts to feel very hot. And here's a case. This is this is actually a case that I worked on. I've taken the name of the um, uh, manufacturer's name off of this, but this is a gel pack. This is a uh, a red liquid gel um, in a, a polyester uh, a plastic uh, container, and it's very flexible. Um, over over towards the right, you'll see a little thing that's a heat indicator. And what that says is it goes low, medium, high as you go up the scale. And then the red thing is it'll, it'll say too hot. So it sort of gives you an indication what the temperature is. But this is a critical thing. So notice where that heat indicator is. Now here's what I did. Um, you'll see these little tags, one, two, three, four. These are locations where I put a very sensitive uh, temperature probes that are able to work in microwave ovens. They're very sophisticated. They're actually fiber optic probes. Um, and I attached them at those locations. Um, I uh, insulated them so the air would have no effect. So all they would measure would be the temperature at that location. Notice where number one is. It's all the way to the left, completely remote from that temperature sensor. Three and four are where that sensor is. Okay, so what I did is I followed the instructions. I put it in a microwave oven. I heat it for a given amount of time. I think it was one minute. And then I took it out of the oven, put it in a special device. Uh, actually, I had tested this before by putting it on my leg to find out what it was like on a bare leg and burned myself. But I set up a device where I could do this to simulate putting it on a leg. And here's the temperature results. Now, if you remember, probe number one is the one that was far remote. It was all the way to the left. And look at the time that on the on the scale going vertical scale, the y-axis, the shows the temperatures in uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And then the bottom is time in seconds. Well, I guess in fractions of a minute. So you'll see now, if you look at that, you'll see that where the pro, where the um, temperature sensor is, those temperatures are really quite low. Those are, you can see those there in uh, uh, probes three and four. You see those temperatures never got very high. Probe one though got extremely high, and in fact, uh, let's see where we can judge it. It it went to 140 degrees in uh, what about fifth, somewhere 15 to 20 seconds, and then hit. 150 degrees uh, by, uh, what is that, about a minute, less than a minute, and kept climbing some. Now, what's the significance of those temperatures? Well, here it is. For adults, these are third-degree burn temperatures. If the, Notice what I said. If the temperature is 140 degrees, it would take five seconds to cause a third-degree burn. Third-degree burn means that you're actually damaging the skin. Uh, and um, it's not just causing redness. You're actually damaging the uh, the uh, epidermis and dermis. Um, if the temperature goes to 149 degrees, it would take uh, two seconds and up at 160, and we do get up close to 160, it would almost take a second to cause a third-degree burn. So here was this consumer who heated that thing, um, put it on a sore muscle. It was... Uh, uh, think on her back as I remember and within um, less than a minute she'd had all the makings of a third degree burn. Now the other thing I want to talk about in this is that the, the manufacturer uh, advertises the fact that this is reusable. So and they say they state on there you can and by the way this can be used as a, a cold pack as well. I didn't say that. In other words, you can refrigerate it. You know, those of you who've gone to dentist and you've had some 
dental surgery or whatever, they tell you to put ice on it or something. Well, you can do one, do one of these things with very cold. But it can be used very hot and um, reusable. And they, the manufacturer claims you can use this over and over again. Well, my findings were you can't do that. The gels tend to be very unstable. Um, and here you can see a picture now following um, the uh, temperature work that I did. Um, I then went and tried to heat it again. And before I did, I saw that there was loose water in there. That is, the gel starts to break down. What does that mean? It 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 weeps. It, it starts releasing its water. So in other words, the water starts coming out. Uh, and then you put it in a microwave oven, and the water gets hot. It forms steam. And um, about a week or two ago, I, I got one of these gel packs. It had been in my lab for about a year. And it looked perfectly fine. I put it in the oven. And uh, I wanted to take a, uh infrared photograph of it, and in less than a minute, it exploded inside my oven. Why? Because when you go from water to steam, the water, uh, it, water vapor expands 3,000 times over the same amount of water. So in other words, it simply expands like crazy and bursts that whole uh, container. So is it really usable? No, not at all. Um, okay, so... Talk about uh, the the overall situation. Then there are several, the, the, basically I said there are several serious flaws with these gel packs. Number one, they heat very unevenly. Number two, the heat guide is inaccurate. The sensor doesn't mean anything where, where it is. You can't judge anything from that. And by the way, that sensor might have worked okay in some in a different oven. Uh, it, it could have been that the, the hottest area was over there, and it depends a lot of, about how, how you place it. In other words, uh, I'm just thinking about this as I'm telling you this. Imagine for a minute you've got a turntable. Well, how do you lay that, that um, uh, gel pack on the turntable? Do you put it, let's say, uh, from side to side if you look from oven direction, or do you put it from front to back? And you would get very, very different heat profiles in that. Okay. Um, so, the, as I said, the heating uniformity is very poor across that surface. Um, and most, as I said, most of the heating will occur in the, in the center. And then the temperature uh, slowly evolves and moves towards the surface. And I said the, the fact that it gels, breaks down, makes reusability uh, dubious. So. A conclusion to the, for this case was this and similar products should not be microwaved. And the cases I've, I've worked on have all been settled in the plaintiff's uh, favor. I do want to take another minute and, and the basic kind of product and just tell you about a really serious issue that came about in a medical malpractice suit. Um, he had a premature infant. She was born about uh, two weeks premature. And her body temperature was about a degree low. So the pediatrician told the nurse to go and heat up one of these gel packs in a microwave oven. Well, the only microwave oven they had was in their uh, lunchroom on the second floor or floor above it. And so she ran up, microwaved it, and brought it down. They put it on the infant. The infant was crying, screaming. Uh, she went took another one, microwaved it, did it again. Well, the result was that the, result, that the infant was so severely burned, she had to be helicoptered to a burn center where she was hospitalized for six months. She lost part of her left buttock, and because of the pain, they could only ameliorate it with morphine. She became a morphine addict, and uh, the result was that she ended up physically and mentally injured. Um, and uh, again, the the, the uh, uh, I was able to determine how the accident occurred, and uh, the the safety of the product, and when it's microwaved, and so on. My conclusion was, product was dangerous, should never have been microwaved, and the case was um, settled in favor of the uh, 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 plaintiff plaintiff's family. Actually, the plaintiff still little girl at the time I was on it, she was about four years old, 
and uh, it was the parents who were her guardians and uh, sued the hospital and the uh, uh, pediatrician. So, some lessons that have come out of this. Number one, all wax and, let's say, no water products should never be microwaved. Um, in case number one, small size, the microwave heating effect on the wax, the sensitivity of the microwave oven to the location, all played a role. Also, there's another thing I don't want to get into, but it has to do with, with the heat properties of wax as as opposed to water. That Not, not having to do with microwaves, but just generally, uh, in, in effect, if you give the same amount of heat to, this, to uh, an equivalent amount of water and wax, the wax will get twice as hot as the water will but in the same period of time. Uh, okay. Now, had the manufacturer tested this product properly, uh, and what do I mean by properly? I mean in a large variety of ovens under various regimens and conditions, it would they, these problems would have shown up. These problems are it doesn't it doesn't take a genius to have these these uh, uh, problems show up. It, this is not uh, um, you know brain surgery as people say. This is a simple uh, test work. You just have to test it in a variety of ovens because ovens all differ, and you've got to uh, do it in. Uh, uh, lots of different regimens. Uh, result of this, by the way, as a side note, result of this case, uh, I've given two uh, research papers at different conferences on the effects of small location, sm uh, small small container, uh, we call them loads, small load effects at different locations in microwave ovens. And if you do that, you find uh, heating patterns um, that uh, show that... Uh, in, you know, you can get very, very intense heating at some places, much less than other, for equivalent amount of time. And it's uh, you can draw pretty, pretty well draw geometric maps for this sort of thing. Um, had the manufacturer gone ahead and tested their product in a variety of ovens, and what do I mean by a variety? By a variety, I would say at least ten ovens. I would bet you that most of these manufacturers don't have more than one or two. And when you talk about a variety of ovens, I'm not talking about just going out and buy 10 brand new ovens. I'm talking about a variety because lots of consumers have older ovens, as we've heard one of the questions. Uh, these ovens can be, you know, 10 years old or more. And they have different properties than the ones today. If there's no turntable in it, they'll get a very different result. And those things have to be tested. Uh, and if they, they are properly done, and then you also, you know, test well. Okay, if you follow, you heat it for exactly one minute. What happens if you heat it for one minute and ten seconds? That can be a big difference. Um, okay. And, you know, the basic thing I've learned over the years, because my lab has done huge amounts of test work for different companies, manufacturers basically don't know how to test their products. And um, as a result, they, they often... Uh, uh, misunderstand the results they're getting and thinking everything's safe. What we've found over the years, and I wrote something about this recently, that um, because of the test work we would get from companies, uh, that uh, products that would come to us that the company manufacturer thought were perfectly fine, were perfectly safe, we would find terrible flaws. Um, why did we find them, not them? Well, they have a vested interest in their product. They really don't want to see it fail. I don't have a vested interest in somebody's product. My job is to see if the thing is safe. And so we find a lot of flaws that way. Um, okay, so. Here's some universal lessons. All products new or following modification of any kind must be tested. Uh, that's an interesting one, modification. I'm going to go to a food product that came in a, uh, it's a, a kind of product that you, you'll see in, the, oh, they're the kind of one lunch things. I think there's one called lunch buckets and stuff. They come in little, what we call plastic tubs. 
and you put a cover on it, a plastic cover, and it's got four holes in it, and you heat it in the microwave oven. And the holes are there to relieve the pressure. Well, we, it was an injury case, a major food company. And I was fortunate enough to get a hold of a uh, product from that actual run that caused the injury. And it was wildly different than their current product. Why? Because they had just changed cap suppliers. And the cap that they used was not as flexible as it should have been, and so injury occurred. So I'm saying that if you're going to do this, you have to follow the instruction, but also test it in a variety of ovens, making modifications, do it. As I say, you've got to try it in lots of different things. Uh, normal abusive testing, abusive means, for example, if you're supposed to take the cover off a jar before you heat it, what happens if you don't take it off, or vice versa? And the other thing, don't assume that consumer will follow your instructions perfectly. Um, believe me, that they, they very rarely do. If it's dangerous, and this is critical, if it's a dangerous product, no set of instructions can guarantee that it won't fail. Okay, I have some time for some questions. Thanks, Bob. If I could have all the attendees enter in the passcode for today, the password is microwave. And if you have any questions for Bob, you can enter those now. Uh, we have a question. Have you spoken about fire in the microwave, also metal in the microwave? Some regarding heating of the food in aluminum containers. Is it safe? What are sparks and fi what, what about sparking and fires? Well, who? <laughs> We could spend an hour on that one. But very quickly, uh, yeah, I know a lot about fires. Um, fires require three things. They require a fuel, like if you're going to make one in a fireplace, it, the wood is your fuel. It needs oxygen, like the air in the room, and it needs a source of ignition. That is the, you know, your match. Well, in a microwave oven, yeah, aluminum, metal, uh, you know, sharp edges on aluminum, things like that can cause arcing, sparking. But if there's no fuel there, uh, it won't happen. Nothing will happen. You'll just you'll hear some snapping and cracking, and it looks kind of frightening, but it's really not dangerous. Uh, have some paper around or something that can burn, it could cause a fire. Uh, they, don't, they really don't happen very much. I really did a lot of work in my own lab trying to create fires. Uh, aluminum containers, you certainly can heat things in aluminum containers. They don't heat efficiently, though, because remember, in a in a... Uh, let's like say paperboard or plastic container, the microwave energy can, can enter from the top, the sides, and the bottom. An aluminum container that can only get in through the top, it'll be reflected from the sides and the bottom. And, and it also has some things to do with some, there's a lot more sophisticated things that has to do with the size and shape of the container. But we do it all the time at home. It just takes longer, um, you know, to, to, to heat. One quick trick I'll give you, you can always tell if something's been heated enough, pick it up and feel the bottom. Put your hands on the bottom of the container. If the bottom of the container is still cold, you still have to heat it some more. Okay, next question. Sure. What about the wattage rating of microwaves? How do they affect the heating process? Usually, not always, but usually the higher the wattage, the faster uh, the cooking will occur. Um, so you you can generally expect that if an oven is rated, say, 1,100 watts, and you compare it to one rated 800 watts, it will heat faster than the, the 1,100 will heat faster than the 800. But what's critical is um, how, how well does it heat something that's small? That is, remember, food products are not huge. They tend to run in, let's say, four ounces, six ounces, well, it's possible, and we've done this in my lab. I have two sharp ovens that vary in output wattage by um, a couple of hundred watts between the two of them. And the lower wattage oven actually heats small small food products faster than the large one. So it's not quite a blanket statement, but generally you can say that you'd expect uh, things to get heated faster in a high wattage oven. How does consumer measure with accuracy that temperature needs to heat a food product, given that there are so many variations in temperature depending on the oven or where the product is placed in the oven? 
Yeah, this is a big, uh, big bugaboo of mine. It's something I've, I've really, I'm very, very um, active in. Um, the problem, for consumers have a huge problem uh, because foods do tend to uh, heat unevenly. And the bigger problem is, uh, let's say you've got a lasagna in there. Well, okay, a lasagna may heat somewhat unevenly. You always find the corners will get hotter than the center. But, you know, it's not all that bad generally. However, if you've got what I call a three-component meal, let's say chicken, broccoli, and, and rice or mashed potatoes, those all heat at different rates in a microwave oven. And now you have to ask, well, how do you how do you know what they are? Well, um, you know, there's a, some foods that are being made by various manufacturers that are called not ready to eat or, uh, you know, still to be, expect the consumer to actually cook them before serving. In other words, lasagna uh, is what we call ready to eat. It's been heated in a ma- manufactured and heated in a factory so that it's fully killed all the bacteria. But uh, some of these products not ready to eat means they haven't done that. So there may be bacteria in there, and it's up to the consumer to heat the product, say, to um, 165 degrees. Well, how does the consumer know that? Well, um, one one way, obviously, if you had a kitchen thermometer, and by the way, kitchen thermometers, but study on those, don't use dial thermometers. Only digital dial thermometers are useless. Um, They don't read accurately, much too slow. Digital thermometers that you buy in a store, pretty good. But you have to probe it at several places. You can't just probe uh, because you're going to get a different temperature in a chicken that you do in the mashed potatoes than you do in a broccoli. Broccoli generally will heat so well you don't even bother measuring that temperature. But chicken you got to worry about. And if it's a chicken breast, where do you measure it? So it's a very sophisticated problem for a consumer, I think way beyond the capabilities of most consumers. Okay, and our last question. Is it dangerous to use a microwave once the fan stops working? Uh, dangerous? Uh, well, first of all, what fan do you mean? If you mean the fan that's cooling the tube, uh, it's not dangerous. Uh, but what will happen was that the tube can overheat. Now, there's a thermal switch on the tube, and it will shut off. So what you may find is you're, you're heating, let's say, your, your cup of coffee, and all of a sudden the oven stops operating. It stops heating. Well, if you let it stand for about 15 minutes, the tube will cool down. You can turn it on, and it's perfectly okay. But um, that's the one kind of fan uh, that cools the tube. Um, it's not a good idea to run it without it, but it certainly you can. The other one, I'm not sure if this is what you mean by the fan, and that is if in, in older ovens, if you look at the ceiling of the oven, uh, that has it up there something that looks like a slowly rotating fan. It's usually hidden behind a plastic shield. But if you look up there, it, 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 is a, uh, it looks like this fan. But if you notice it, you look at it carefully, all the blades are pitched at different angles. This is what's called a mode mixer or a mode stirrer. What it does is it interacts as the microwaves come into it. It sort of disperses them around the oven. It makes the pattern inside the oven more even. Uh, you don't find them much in, in ovens today. If it's not, if that one is not working, yeah, that's a problem. Then you ought to get rid of the oven. Thanks, Bob. Okay. In addition to being your best source for testifying to consulting experts for the past 60 years, TASCA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, day in the life videos, research reports on expert witness, including the Challenge History Report 2.0, Professional Sanction Search, and Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity, opportunity to, to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Bob Schiffman for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Bob or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following with, with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. Thank you all for attending. This concludes our program for today.